All right, um, I'm going to start the seminar. Uh, hello and welcome to today's seminar. It's so uh, exciting to see that so many of you are here today. Uh, my name is Luis and I'm one of the organizers of this digital seminar together with Lena, Ida, Frida and Josephine. Uh, me and Lena uh, will be the moderators during this seminar today. And before we begin, there are a few things I would like to highlight. So the seminar will be recorded for it to be able to be uploaded on fuf.se and on our YouTube channel Fuf Play. And at Fuf Play, you can find more videos of previously held seminars and other interesting videos about development. If you don't feel comfortable um, being recorded during the seminar, please turn off your camera. And for everyone, please remember to mute your microphones during the whole seminar so we can hear the speakers without any problems. Um, it's possible to ask questions to the speakers we have here today. And questions are more than welcome. And you can write them in the chat that you find in the bottom row of the window of the Zoom window down there. The questions from the chat will then be presented in the end where we are having a Q&A. And we might not have time to ask all the questions to the speakers, but we will work to try to make it through them all before we end this seminar. Yes, and here comes an overview of the following hour. Our three speakers will shortly present themselves and the organization they work for. And following their presentations, a discussion will take place. And afterwards, uh, you, the public, will be able to get answers to your questions. Uh, so my name is Lena, and I also work as a volunteer within the event group at FUF. And if you're unfamiliar with FUF, uh, we are the Swedish Development Forum, which is a politically and religiously independent non-profit organization. And our aim is to raise awareness and engagement on global development issues to contribute to a fair and sustainable world. And today we're here to learn more about children's situation during the pandemic. And therefore, we have invited three speakers. We have Anne Paulsen from the World Food Programme, Peter Brune from War Child, and Malin Flemström from The Hunger Project Sweden. And before we give the talking stick to Anne, we would just like to congratulate uh, the World Food Programme uh, as laureate of the Nobel Peace Prize this year. Uh, but so please, Anne, would you like to present yourself and uh, the World Food Programme and explain how children's situation has changed uh, given COVID-19? Thank you so much uh, for this introduction and thank you for, for your, uh, for your uh, congratulations. Um, it was indeed quite a surprise and um, as you probably all know, this is, of course, it has our name on it, but it is a prize that we share with the entire sort of uh, humanitarian community. Uh, it was exactly given to us um, um, in recognition of uh, the fact that international solidarity and, and co multilateral collaboration has never been more important. So I think it's, it's a prize we all share and I think we should take pride in it as a, as a global humanitarian and development community. Um, so about the organization, I had, uh, and, and just two words about myself, I had the Nordic office here in Copenhagen uh, we're a small uh, office that caters to the Nordic countries in terms of communication, advocacy and outreach. Really important because the Nordic donors are extremely important to the World Food Programme, not just in terms of dollars and cents or kroner and euro, but also in, in terms of their the strategic collaboration we have with Sweden and Denmark and so forth. Um, the World Food Programme, we are... Uh, we are um, working to both save and change lives. Uh, we have a dual mandate. I think most people know us more or better from our humanitarian mandate. So when there is a tsunami, an earthquake, a sudden, a sudden onset of either a man-made or a nature-made um, disaster, we are there and we are the front frontline agency to feed hungry people and save their lives. Um, we assist around 100 million people every year in, in 88 countries. Um, the dual mandate also, um, also includes uh, the longer term sort of uh, resilience and, and development. We are, uh, we just don't, we 
do not only want to just save lives, we want to change lives so that eventually, you know, we become, we become, um, uh, we don't need to be there anymore. So we have 193 nations who will be food secure and who will be able to uh, provide for their own um, people. Uh, so we work alongside governments as well to, to strengthen capacities and build uh, food systems that will enable them to feed their own uh, people and not depend on organizations such as ours or any other working in this field. Um, just about sort of the, 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 the issue, there's 690 million hungry people in the world today. That's one in nine. And I think that's really even, sorry my language, but perverted. In a world of plenty where there's food enough for everyone, there's so much food that we allow one third of it to go wasted. Still, there's one in nine who will have to go to bed hungry uh, every night. That number uh, or the number of those who are critically hung hungry, those marching towards the um, bring of starvation that is actually increasing we predict because of COVID-19 now that it will increase from uh, by 80 percent from 149 million to 270 million at the beginning of next year so these are the people really really on the brink of uh, starvation and and the numbers are driven by by several things by conflict by climate change uh, economic chaos and now with the latest pandemic um, the COVID-19. Um, normally in, 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 in any emergency or any hardship, children are among those who suffer the most. If you are, you know, if you're a parent and you live under the, the, the poverty threshold, if you have less than two uh, dollars to make good on, I, my first job with the World Food Program was in Haiti and where half of the population lives under uh, under the 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 poverty threshold maybe even more now because they're facing a lot of uh, problems and um, you know as a parent you have to take really really brutal choices because these are countries that don't have social safety nets as we know from sweden or from denmark where you know we have free health care we have free education so our parents never had to take this brutal choice do i send my child to school or do I keep the money so I can feed her or do I save them for if she needs medical care at some point. Um, so the children always pay the biggest price and we also saw it uh, during the, um, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic or I've seen it during the COVID-19 pandemic where schools have closed down and where almost 370 million school children missed out uh, on the school meals that they were provided with through school uh, and on which they depend because this is normally the only nutritious meal they'll get that day. Um, so the closure of societies has had a huge impact on uh, children due to uh, COVID-19. I see that my time is up, so I better stop here and save something for the questions uh, later on. <laughs> but thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Anne. Uh, we would like to hear more, and we will. Uh, but let's continue with you, Peter. Um, how do you? Uh, how does War Child, uh, World Child's work with children, and what have changed since the pandemic? Um, so thank you for this opportunity. As I, my name is Peter. I work here in the Stockholm office of War Child, and we are covering the Sweden and also the Nordic countries. A few words about Warchild, if I may, uh, and then we can come back to the question how the pandemic has influenced um, the situation for vulnerable children worldwide, not only in the 15 countries where we work, but also in places like Sweden and, and, and well, richer countries. Um, Warchild is a um, child rights organization, and uh, we have specialized in... Um, making sure that no child should grow up in war ever, period. That's our mission and mandate. And we were founded 25 years ago by a person, a young lady in those days from Holland, and she was involved in the wars in, or she visited um, the Balkans and saw the suffering that uh, the war did to all human beings, but especially to children, but also how uh, much the adult world lacked the capacity to adequately address the needs of children growing up in war. 
giving children the opportunity really to express themselves when it comes to not using words, but also expressing themselves by uh, play, by um, uh, art, artistic expression, etc. You can say you can be upset about children playing war on the schoolyard, but in the end, I mean, as adults, we can talk about it over the fika um, in the coffee room. But children have to express it in their way. And that is where we have uh, developed our specific methodology to try to assist uh, how children can be helped in expressing and working on uh, different experiences, uh, difficult experiences they go through in their daily life. So we are present in 15 countries. I'll come back to, to those countries later in the discussion where we see uh, how the pandemic is affecting children. Um, but it's the kind of normal uh, suspects, the usual suspects. It's, it's uh, war-torn countries in, in, in other parts of the world uh, where children are suffering. Uh, say the children recently released a report saying 160 million children are uh, growing up in high intense uh, conflict zones. A terrible number. I mean, those children should really not be growing up there. I mean, it's such a massive failure for the adult world to allow that the 160 million children grow up in high intense conflict zones. Uh, another characteristic besides being present in those 15 countries, uh, and I can tell more about what we do there in a moment, um, but uh, another characteristic for Warchild is that we actually are uh, also doing research, analysis, and methods development on the conflicts we are working in. So um, uh, some seven, eight years ago, we set up a, a research department in, um, in our organization. And today we have some 15 qualified researchers that only do kind of the analysis and research on how does the war and the conflict affect children and what can you do about it. So since the creation of this um, research department, we have published some 30 plus scientific articles and scientific journals. And that is something that we really see that it's a growing interest in trying to develop evidence-based uh, approaches to what actually works. And an important point of departure is, of course, the Child Rights Convention with the three pillars, education. And education, education, education can't be stressed enough. Secondly, the uh, child protection component, the physical integrity of children growing up in refugee camps who have been forced to flee from their home country. And the third component where we as an organization are potentially best or actually dare to claim that we do have very much of expertise and understanding is the third pillar, namely uh, psychosocial support. Children who have their special needs and their special um, conditions to express themselves uh, have the right to qualified psychosocial support. And, and that we really try to address and make sure that kids do have this right um, also considered when it comes to trying to alleviate the situation for children growing up in war. I stop there. I think i am given my five minutes presentation of the organization and let's come back to more details where the children affected by conflict are living and how they're affected by the pandemic. Of course. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Um, we we're going to move on to Malin. Uh, Malin, can you tell us about the Hunger Project Sweden and how your work is important in the global hunger issue? Yes, thank you, Louise, and, and thank you for, for inviting us to this seminar. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Malin Flemström, and I am the country director of the Hunger Project in Sweden. Uh, we form part of a global network uh, where the Hunger Project is present in tw 23 countries worldwide. So we are a global organization uh, with a mission to end hunger and poverty by pioneering sustainable grassroots women-centered strategies and to advocate for their widespread adoption in countries throughout the world. We currently implement programs in 13 countries, and today we reach 16 million people. So we work with a holistic approach, addressing the underlying issues that keep hunger in place in, in a society and in communities. 
Uh, the process that we work with is called community-led development. As many of you know, uh, the top-down and aid-driven charity models fail to create the lasting change in the life of those in need. So we see that we, in order to achieve a sustainable solution to the end of hunger, uh, that we need to flip that model on its head and afford those living in hunger access, access to the education and to the tools needed to end hunger for good. We see that we can play a part in creating that enabling environment, but we need to let people lead their own development. So just briefly, during this pandemic, we have really seen that this model of community-led development is working. Uh, throughout the course of the year, we have uh, um, developed a network of 500,000 trained local leaders that instantly could act and respond to provide their communities with access to the right information and prevention measures. Uh, given the fact that we are local and work through this network of local animators, as we call them, we never needed to, to draw back during this pandemic because we were already very local in that sense. So while, we, while our methodology is adapted to meet the different local challenges and opportunities wherever we work, uh, our program has sort of a, a fundament that is focused on, on three specific pillars. The first one being a focus on women. And this is because women bear almost all responsibility for meeting basic needs of the family, but yet they are systematically denied the resources the information and freedom of action they need to fulfill this responsibility. A study shows that when women are supported and empowered, all of society benefits. Their families are healthier, more children go to school, agricultural productivity improves and income increases. So in short, uh, communities become more resilient. So we firmly believe that empowering women to be key change agents is an essential element to achieving the end of hunger and poverty. So wherever we work, our programs aim to support women and to build their capacities. Our second pillar is to mobilize communities. So all our strategies seek to build people's capacities, leadership and confidence. We train both women and men and equipping them with the skills, the methods, and the knowledge that they need to take self-reliant actions to improve their lives and conditions in their own communities. The third one is, is fostering local partnership and to engage the local government. In the countries where the Hunger Project work, the, the government structures are in many ways very uh, decentralized. So the local government is closest to the people and have the mission of working with people to meet the basic needs. So the Hunger Project work in partnership with the local government bodies to ensure that they are effective, that they include the leadership of women, and that they are directly accountable to the local people and provide access to the resources and information that are requested by the population. So that is in brief uh, what we are doing. I will also uh, address the issues on how the pandemic has affected the work that we are doing later on in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Mami, for your presentation. So to discuss the topic in more detail, we're gonna uh, move on to some questions. Uh, and now I have a question for you, Peter. Uh, how have conflicts been affected by the coronavirus pandemic and children in affected regions? You were talking about a few countries before. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, and, and it's a great opportunity to have the chance to speak with an interested audience on this. Um, I mean, I talk every week with our uh, country directors in the 15 countries in which we work. Um, and it's heartbreaking really to take part of their stories on uh, they try to deliver support, but how the pandemic is really badly uh, influencing the situation. I mean, there are attempts to, on both national level, but global level as well, to, to do something about this. 
Um, and maybe you were aware that in March, the UN Secretary General called for a ceasefire, uh, saying, well, let's fight the pandemic and not each other. And a total of 177 states signed this petition, but we can still see that violence goes on. Uh, Save the Children released a report on 20th of November, the day of the Child Rights Convention, uh, where they highlight a little bit the situation, how it is in different parts of the world. Um, I mean, it's a little bit um, simplistic to believe that, okay, now there's a virus and then all the conflicts will end and, and uh, uh, Israel will uh, pull out of the occupied territories and uh, Morocco will pull out of Western Sahara and uh, all the other conflicts ongoing. Well, now we'll all make peace because there's a virus. I mean, that is not the case. It's rather the contrary. There were countries, opponents, warring parties use the situation to promote their own position and, and take advantage of the situation. So, so the most dangerous countries for children in conflict that we see, uh, and this also complies with the report that Save the Children released on, on, on the Child Rights Convention Day, is Syria, of course, obviously, Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Iraq, South Sudan, and uh, Sudan. The figures are horrible. Um, more than three million children are living in an area where violence has been raging for 18 years. I mean, they're underage under, until they get the age of 18. And then more than 3 million children have spent their whole childhood in, in, in war. We see also worrying factors like the number of children recruited by armed forces has gone up. Um, and the, Figures for 2020 are apparently not available yet, but uh, in 2018, we had uh, 639 children that were recruited to armed forces. In 2000, uh, sorry, it increased by now close to 1,000 in 2000, uh, from 2018 to 2019. So all these are bad figures that really show um, that the situation already uh, is bad but it uh, is a big risk, of course, that it will become even worse. And then as an organization, you have to uh, try to balance what you try to do about this. Do you want to act immediately only to respond to the short-term needs? Uh, or do you want to stick to your mandate, which in our case also includes their research? component, where, as I said, we have some 50 researchers, we have published uh, yearly, we published some five, six uh, uh, articles in scientific journals, uh, evidence-based, and of course, you, you can say that, well, now there is a different situation, so forget about the research, now it's about saving lives. And uh, that is something you have to balance then. I mean, you can say, well, uh, is it the reality that is uh, correct, or is it the map that is correct? You can use metaphors like, okay, now the land is flooded, so we don't see the map. We only see water now, and we have to do something about those who are drowning. But then in the end, you must also think about the situation where there is a, it goes back to a situation where the water is away, but there might be coming other things like uh, increase in malaria or whatever that might be. And our focus is, of course, on children. I mean, um, that is where I, I think um, uh, it's so sad to see when populistic uh, leaders try to make use of the situation. We have seen that in the countries where we are working. Um, but uh, where um, they think, well, easy solutions will kind of promote my uh, standing in, in society, etc., and and where we need to have a more long-term vision in order to address the needs um, of of the people, not only now but also in the long-term perspective, because there will be more disasters coming. And how do we prepare for that? I think I stop there right now and hand back to you. So, uh, if there are more specific questions to me as well. 
Of course. Uh, we wanted to, uh, to uh, involve Anne and Malin in this question about uh, conflicts and uh, uh, how Corona has affected that also um, connected to hunger. So I'm going to start with you, Anna, if you have anything you want to add to this uh, focus on conflict. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Louise. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, what I want to say is first and foremost that, that Peter is absolutely right. It is extremely naive to think that conflicts will end just uh, because there is now a COVID-19 pandemic. And I also agree that it is actually on the contrary or, and, 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 and history has shown us that whenever there is a lack of resources, uh, people will, it will lead to instability and people might start fighting over those scarce resources. Um, that has been the case all up through history and is unfortunately still uh, the case uh, today. And I think that's also why, if I may allow me to go back on the Nobel Peace Prize that we were awarded this year, I think there is a growing recognition of how fundamental food security is and how fundamental it is for stability in societies. When people, when parents can no longer feed their children, they become desperate. And they will, they will uh, turn to these extremely sort of um, extreme coping mechanisms. And eventually they might, you know, um, children, girls will be married off early, boys might be sort of sold to go fight with extremist groups or uh, families, entire families may put themselves in a, in a rubber boat to try to cross the Mediterranean with the risk of their lives and come to other parts of the world, which is not, not I mean, which is another destabilizing uh, factor for, for the, for the host countries. Um, so, so unfortunately, and, and still, um, conflicts drive uh, is the main driver of uh, hunger in the world today. 60% of the hungry people live in, in, in countries that are in conflict. And um, 10 out of uh, 13 of our biggest World Food Program, biggest operations are in, in countries with conflict. Um, there is, uh, as we move into 2021, there are four countries that are uh, getting you know, dangerously close to to famine, and they are all countries in conflict. It's Yemen, it's South Sudan, it's northeastern um, Nigeria, and it's Burkina Faso. There is a real fear and a famine alert for those four countries moving into 2021. So, um, so, so, so conflict is definitely one of the key drivers. Um, the Secretary General uh, went out. The UN Secretary General. Um, Antonio Guterres went out at the beginning of the, um, the when when the pandemic broke out, uh, urging all countries to, um, you know, he called for a global ceasefire. Um, and and there is, I mean, there is, I mean, what what could possibly be more perverse than 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 fighting in the middle of a cripple crippling pandemic? But unfortunately, that's the case. So. If hunger stems from conflict and from political uh, conflicts, we also need these political solutions. We can keep on feeding people, which we do, and, and this is our, our finest mandate to save lives, also to change lives, making sure that we end needs and not just continue to feed the same people over and over again. But we need the political solutions to, 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 to be able to end hunger. Um, the rest of it is a band-aid. Um, so, so the key drivers and the structural drivers, conflict, climate change, um, and sort of capable governments and, 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 and empowered governments is, is the key uh, to, to, to end hunger. Over? Mm. Um, no, I agree. It's uh, horrible and everything is really connected. So Marlene, do you have anything you want to add to this question as well? No, not really. I think Anne covered it very thoroughly. Um, I mean, it's it's evident that that conflict leads to hunger, and hunger leads to conflict. It's it's a very clear and kind of a simple correlation there. So, it's really an issue that needs to to be addressed. Yes. Uh, well, it's very complex, and that also brings us to uh, a question that I'm going to ask you, Marlene, Actually, 
um, because uh, the market survey survey that you conducted in April 2020, where you asked people about their views and attitudes on world hunger, it mentions there that there has been an increase in hunger globally over the past five years, and it's getting worse now due to the coronavirus pandemic. So what did you observe were the reasons for the increase in hunger before the pandemic hit? Yes. Uh, so yeah, we did, we did a, a survey uh, that actually focused on youth in Sweden and their uh, perception of hunger and sort of the knowledge base as well of youth in Sweden in terms of hunger. Um, it was it was quite interesting and also actually inspiring to see that 70% responded that they think that we actually can end the world hunger uh, to 2030. Uh, however, the uh, goal number two of the SDGs were not the prioritized goal for youth, uh, but some of the key drivers behind the increase in hunger were such as uh, climate. Um, so as you were saying, the, there was a decline for decades, uh, but the trend uh, reversed in 2014. So the decline was from 991 million hungry people in 1990 to 629 in 2014, and then a rise up to 690 million today. Uh, as Anne also were saying, we there is um, really an expected increase due to the pandemic uh, in 2020 alone, uh, where an estimate is that 132 million people uh, will be added to, to those 690. Um, so I would say that sort of the two of the most documented areas of inequality behind hunger previous to, to the the trend sort of reversing would, uh, as we see it, is the, the gender then. So the chance of being food insecure is 13% higher for women than men, uh, which is largely due to social conditions that limit their opportunities and decision power. Uh, men own more than 50% uh, wealth than women, and they predominate in positions of political and economic power, which also mean that they are able to shape policy and practices towards their own interests, while uh, at the same time relying on women's vast unpaid and underpaid labor. Another issue of inequality driving hunger um, for centuries is, is the poverty issue. So hunger and poverty are high, highly correlated, but by addressing economic inequality in particular is really increasingly seen as essential to end poverty because economic growth alone cannot do the job. We need to address the inequality also. Uh, and then as Anne was saying, the, the point, sort of the experts, experts are pointing to, to three new key drivers in the recent rise in hunger, which is the economic forces, uh, the climate change and, and war and conflict. Uh, and also now the, the current pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Malin. Uh, so what about solutions? You were, Malin was naming uh, some problems. Anne, uh, with your experience and work within eradicating hunger in many conflict affected areas, what are your reflections on what is missing during this prevailing global pandemic? Again, um, I think we need uh, the political will. That's a very brief answer to that. Of course, there's a lot of other factors that have to come together. You you have to have a strong, strong, in, in, you know, you have need to have the infrastructure. You have to need, uh, you need to have robust um, food systems. Uh, but basically, you have to have, and the key, key issue here is to have the political will to to really want to end conflicts. I Again, I agree, it's totally naive uh, to just say like that, but that is the fact that this is what we need, in, in especially in the situation that we are in uh, right now. One of our main concerns, and I, I hate to al always make this also into a question of funding, but funding, of course, is key. Uh, we're an organization that lives on voluntary 
contributions. Um, we do not have any assessed contributions. So for every single uh, country operation, for every single program, for every single person, we intend to assist. We have to go uh, ask governments predominantly for, uh, for the funding. And I want here, if I may, just to uh, highlight the role of Sweden as one of our, it is our top donor of uh, funding, not just any kind of funding, but flexible funding, which allows us to work more efficiently and effectively and help us help more people for the same um, amount of money than, than if they had been earmarked. So, so Sweden together with the other Nordic countries are really sort of model uh, donors to the World Food Programme. Um, we predict uh, that we will need 15 billion US dollars next year to allow us to feed 138 million uh, people. And these 138 million people are really the most vulnerable of those already vulnerable and, 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 and hungry. Um, and, and of course, in a world uh, that has been so paralyzed by COVID-19, where economies are totally in, in, in at their knees uh, because of COVID-19, because of the total lockdown of societies, closure of businesses, people losing their jobs, remittances not being paid as they normally did, which is an in source of income for, for many, many, I mean, millions of families in, in the countries where we work. These are really sort of alarming prospects and we're really worried that we will not be able um, to assist those 138 million who are the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. So, of course, funding uh, comes in as a very key sort of issue as well. And, and, and um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so uh, as you said, funding seems to be like the key uh, factor. But Peter, do you have uh, any other things you would like to highlight uh, that are important now during the pandemic and oh. other conflicts? Um, I think we have also in the development sector, the aid sector, seen that um, the uh, quest for digital solutions has been going up, which is good, I think. I mean, in the end, uh, if I look what we have been doing, we have always, not always, but for a long time striving, been striving to see that we find digital solutions related to education, for example. Because if you live in a refugee camp, uh, it's difficult to, to um, build up a full school structure. And, and, and there I think there are uh, opportunities that well, will become stronger and, and uh, actually also enhance the opportunity to reach out to more people through digital solutions, online education, as we see in our countries, but that we simply do that for millions of children that are outside the normal school schooling system. Another area where you can actually apply this much more consistently is uh, related to mental health and the psychosocial support. We know that uh, already the mental health crisis is, uh, if I may use the word, exploding. It's really going up the mental health issues worldwide, also for children, and early action is extremely important. Um, but to do more to promote uh, uh, online uh, digital solutions in all areas of the work. I mean, of course, food is maybe very different, but uh, in many other areas, there is there are opportunities where you can use um, digitization for smart logistical solutions, etc. And then something I think is also really important is also not to lose kind of the focus on. Uh, maintaining a rights-based approach. I think that's so important, especially in times of crisis, that you kind of try to at least keep the perspective on what do we want to change in the long-term perspective and what might even be getting worse due to the pandemic. And, and there you have to have a long-term perspective, maybe uh, 2025 or why not kind of trying to uh, keep the focus on the SDGs because they are useful. And, and there we have the focus on 2030. And then and, and, and let's try to to stick to that as well and then not get lost in now we have to solve a very immediate problem and therefore we, we forget about all the long-term issues that we need to keep in focus as well. Absolutely. 
Um, yeah, I totally agree. And it's very interesting to hear you uh, answer these questions. Um, we're actually getting a bit tight of time to be able to ask uh, or to bring up the questions that we've got. Uh, so we want to thank you for uh, your very interesting answers, both Anne, Peter and Malin. And uh, I'm going to hand over the microphone to uh, Ida, who is our colleague at FUF, and to take over and start the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much, Luis, and thank you to all of our three speakers for sharing these uh, extremely interesting insights on this very important topic. Uh, we now have about 20 minutes for the Q&A session, and we have already received a lot of uh, good questions in the chat. And you are, of course, more than welcome to post more if you would like. Um, to ensure that we will have enough time to go through as many questions as possible, I would kindly ask all the speakers to be rather brief and concise in their answers. Um, yeah, so to begin with, I would actually like to pose a question to you, Peter. There was the first question in the chat that reads as follows. Do you see a risk that the amount of child, child soldiers would increase in the conflict affected areas, considering that these areas are also affected by the pandemic at the moment? You touched upon this a bit already, but uh, yes. Please, the floor is yours, Peter. Okay, I'll try to be very brief. I mean, we don't know. That is the short answer. But we see tendencies that if the state uh, or the control mechanism, the UN system, NGOs, local authorities, schools, not least, uh, are closed or are not capable of doing the normal job, those who try to make use of that situation um, will do so. And of course, school closure is a situation that is uh, putting children at risk, as we have to be aware of in Sweden as well, but even more so in, in, in many other places. And people will take benefit of that, and then children are vulnerable. I think DRC is a, an area where we might see an increase in child soldiers. But uh, I can't give you any figures, um, but uh, that is a typical area where we can see that, well, child soldiers have been used and the risk of, for further recruitment is apparent. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, next, I would like to turn to uh, both Anne and Marlin. And the question in the chat reads as follows. As a citizen of one of the countries where these organizations conduct their developmental slash humanitarian work, I'm just wondering how they can ensure that their overall support reaches the aimed beneficiaries, especially when we witness some of the very own policymakers involved in corruption. Um, Perhaps, Anne, you would like to uh, address this question first, and then we will take Malin. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and, and a very sort of uh, important and relevant question. So thank you, um, Diane. I think it is, I can see in the chat. Um, I mean, key to our work is that we are able to assess, assess the needs so that needs are driven or, or, or support is driven uh, purely on humanitarian principles and nothing else. It can never be an instrument for, for war, which we have seen in the past. And this is why um, also Sweden, when they were in the Security Council, were the main key driver, one of the four countries that drove the resolution, UN Security Council Resolution 2417, on the use of, of, food, uh, of hunger and starvation as a weapon of uh, war. We have seen that, of course, we cannot allow that. We will never allow that. So key in our programming is the fact that we have to have access to areas um, where the hungry people are so we can assess who are the hungry people, why are they hungry, and how can we best help them with the resources we have so that our system is based on needs and needs only and nothing else and we have been in situation really really uh, brutal situations where we have had to stop our assistance that happened most recently in in in, in uh, northern parts of uh, yemen 
where we were not allowed to come in and have this crucial assessment. And we were not allowed either to, once food was distributed, to come in, back in and monitor that the food actually went uh, to the right people and not fell in to the control of, uh, of warring fractions. So that is funda a fundamental part of our work and, and, and a very sort of cornerstone in, in everything, ensuring that food and food assistance is distributed based on humanitarian uh, principles alone and, and nothing else. And also um, going back to 2011 uh, with the drought in the Horn of Africa where um, we saw famine, uh, real, you know, widespread famine in, in, in the southeastern part of Somalia. The reason why it came so far, it came to a famine, was the fact that we were, um, you know, we had to withdraw from, from that part of Somalia because uh, we were not any longer allowed to, to have those, to have that access to assess and to monitor. And we could no longer guarantee that food wouldn't be used for the right, for the wrong purposes and thereby causing more harm um, than, than good. Over. Wonderful, thank you so much, Anne. And Marlene, would you like to add something to what Anne has just said? Yeah, I can just uh, briefly add from uh, our experience during this pandemic um, related to India, where um, the hunger product doesn't work really in, in the humanitarian aid uh, sphere. However, there are increasingly humanitarian contexts in the countries where we work as well. So. Just to give an example where we saw in India, the Hunger Project works with elected women representatives, which are um, leaders, political leaders at the lowest sort of democratical institution closest to the people, which are called the Panchayats. So these women are part of our five-year program where we work with them in their leadership model, but also skills assessments. These women had play, have played a crucial role in their own uh, villages during the pandemic to really be the bridge between some of the humanitarian assistance coming into these areas and to do the assessment of uh, where the needs are the greatest because they live, they work, and they know their uh, neighbors and, and uh, people around them and, and they know these families very well. So they could really carry out their political mandate during this pandemic and be that bridge between the external uh, much needed provided service, but also to make sure that the needs assessment were really anchored in, in their societies. Thank you so much, Martin, for explaining that. Um, now I would again turn to you, Peter. And we have a question that says, how have the related controlled measures of COVID-19 affected children's participation in the decision-making process regarding their well-being in the camp settlement? Um, go ahead, please, Peter. Thank you for the question. Uh, I mean, one um, key component in the Child Rights Convention is that children should be included in all aspects of life that affect them. And, um, that is something uh, we try to promote all the time. Listen to children, involve them, uh, take their viewpoints into account as much as is realistic and possible. And what we see is, of course, uh, unfortunately, that situations of pandemic do not promote that kind of response. Um, I was talking uh, last week with um, uh, our um, person responsible for the Syria program. And yeah, um, children being vulnerable uh, and, and having difficulties in that sense to express their needs are neglected. And that, again, leads to consequences that are not good. Um, for example, in increased stress, increased mental illness. And if you don't treat that in time or deal with it in time, that is really having an impact much um, to, to risks to really increase the, the, the effects of, of the, the pandemic for the children in the long-term perspective. UNICEF says 1.5 million children, 1.5 billion, billion, 1,500 million children are out of school due to the pandemic. 
And that's another area where children do have an influence on uh, defining what's important in their lives. And, and if schools are closed, I mean, that is something we need to take into account. And that's where I'm also trying to get back to the importance of the maintaining a rights-based approach to things in order to secure the, the, the uh, perspectives of the children to be considered. It's a complex question, and then again, I have one point to say that, well, much knowledge is lacking still. There is a knowledge gap, which we will have to work on in the coming years. Uh, but as far as I hear from our 15 country offices, uh, the situation for the children is developing the wrong way, unfortunately. Uh, thank you so much, Peter, for addressing this, as you said, rather complex question. Um, we have got more questions in the chat and there is one that I think I could perhaps address to all three of you. Um, so the question goes, what is your view on the sustainable development goal to zero hunger and will it be achieved in time? And I would first give the turn to Malin and then Anne, and then Peter, if you have something you would like to add to that. Thank you. Uh, I, I saw another question here uh, regarding a proverb uh, that I would like to address in, in connection to this, um, because I think it, it's correlated. I think that we must stop treating resource poor people as needy, and we need to recognize women and men as problem solvers that are held back by an unjust system. And regarding that proverb, I think it's, it, you know, people don't need us to, to give them fish, fish or even teach them how to fish. They actually need us to stop putting barbed wire around the fish ponds. So it's really, uh, we are not on track to reach the goal of zero hunger. Uh, and we, to do so, we need systematic changes. Because the system, as, as it is today, top-down driven, is not really recognizing women and men at the grassroots level at, at sort of as key change agents for the sustainable end of hunger. So um, it's also connected to the, the second, the third question there on the partnership model. Uh, the hunger project is when the SDGs were announced at the UN, at the very same time, the hunger project announced an alliance called the Movement for Community-Led Development, which is now uh, present in over 50 countries uh, around the world that looking at the systematic changes in the development sector that are needed for people to be recognized as sort of actors of change and leaders of development. So we think that doing, we don't need to do more of what we're doing now, sort of as a global community. We can't keep on pouring funding into a broken system. We have to change the system. So. Obviously, I, it's our hope and belief that we can end hunger, but we need to do more and we need to do it differently in order to, to reach the goal for 2030. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Marlene. And it's really good that you also drew on the other two questions in the chat. Um, Anne, would you like to add something? Yeah, it, it's hard to see what I can really add uh, to what Marlene already said, because I, I fully agree that these uh, things, you know, partnerships, um, building resilience and, and ending, zero, ending hunger by 2030 all uh, go together really strongly. On, on the fish and fishing issue, I want to say, and based on my experience, uh, before I became WFP, I was a journalist and I traveled in, in a number of countries as well in, in war, conflict or natural disasters or chronic uh, poverty and, and hunger and whatnot. And based on my experience and, and my first experience with the World Food Programme, there are situations, there are big pockets of people in a number of countries where you just don't get out there and you, you sort of like, okay, I'll teach you how to fish. It, it really doesn't make sense when everything has been leveled by an earthquake or flushed away by a tsunami or, or tropical storms. There is a period of time in, in the life of people where you, you simply have to save lives. Um, and, 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 and you have to do those handouts, even if, if we don't think they're sustainable and, you know, 
um, supporting the long-term development. But, you know, standing with a mother in, in, in northern parts of one of the really poor parts of Haiti, she already lost two children to, to hunger. And, and she's in a health clinic with the third child gone blind because of just basic lack of vitamin vitamins something we can solve in our parts of the world by going down to the pharmacy or the uh, whatever they call these stores and, and and just buy a pot of vitamin pills for for 50 krono or not that is a luxury that doesn't exist in these in these corners of the world and start telling her you know think about tomorrow or think about a week from now or think about a month from now or a year from now it doesn't make sense because at all her hours awake is concentrated around getting the next meal on the table for for herself but not least for her children so 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 it's just to say that that there are times and circumstances where saving lives is really really important but of course in doing so and doing it the smart way is to make a humanitarian kroner or dollar count as a development dollar so that everything we do over here where we save lives it's eventually building into sort of the first recovery and then resilience building and then long-term development so we don't sort of go into an emergency operation without having a clever exit strategy um where you know we we we, we build resilience and we you know we may start by giving people people handouts, but what they really want, what people really want is a hand up. They want to be capacitated to take their lives and their destinies into their own hands. Nobody I ever met in Denmark or in Haiti or elsewhere just dream of being fed for the rest of their lives. This this might have been the way it was. We, we turned 60 next year and the way we were created was, uh, you know, as an organization, there was a lot of extra food in our parts of the world. We didn't know what to do with it. It was just filling up on, on in warehouses and then people got, go, got, went hungry down in Africa and we sent it with big planes or big ships. That's of course far from how we work today. We work digital solutions as mentioned by Peter, innovation are crucial and, 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 and working to, to, to create that long-term in partnerships is really, really crucial. I'll stop myself there. Sorry for taking that much time. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much. And this was really interesting. Um, Peter, would you like to add anything to what uh, Marlin and Anna said? I mean, I'm, you and the, Marlin and, uh, and Anna, the experts in SDG2, I just want to highlight that the SDGs are interconnected. And that's also precisely what uh, Anna is trying to uh, address here, the difficulties in maintaining a kind of long-term approach with meeting the needs immediately. and. Uh, that's the classical question. Maybe uh, we should spend more time on understanding the triple nexus and the complexity. I mean, you have the classical divide between uh, humanitarian needs that needs to be met and the long-term development perspectives. And but doing that in the context of conflict, that's what is then referred to the triple nexus where well, we need to understand much better uh, this complexity. I mean, I, I, I was always lecturing for those um, Swedish soldiers that were deployed to Afghanistan. And, and they kind of had this, oh, how difficult can it be to hand out a blanket to people who are freezing? I said, it can be extremely complicated to hand out the blanket in the right way, because you can make many mistakes by handing out blankets. So don't ever under, underestimate the difficulty of handing out a blanket. Not saying that you shouldn't do it, but be aware of the complexity of the issue. And that is something I think we need to keep in mind. There are no quick fixes or easy solutions. Thank you so much, Peter. And I completely agree with that thought. Um, thank you so much to all three of you for sharing these thoughts and reflections. Um, it was really interesting and we would of course love to continue this discussion, but uh, since our time is running out, I will want to say thank you and hand over back to Lena. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's now time to close the seminar, uh, the webinar, and thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, Anne, Peter and Malin uh, for coming here this morning to shed light on the important issues that have followed the pandemic and other conflicts. Uh, and thank you also to everyone for attending. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed the lear and learned something from these uh, discussions. And if you enjoyed these kinds of events and would like to learn more about global development issues, you can also become a member of FUF and you can find more information about that on FUF.se. 
Uh, I also want to uh, thank you all again for attending and thank you the speakers. It's been very interesting. And we all, me and my fifth colleagues, want to uh, wish you a very good rest of the day, but also a very good December. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a great opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.